<coughs> the first uh, morning of our four-day retreat and our first uh, talk. Um, forgive me, I didn't catch this. I, on the schedule, it says that the retreat is called the Four Mind Seals of Dharma. This is not the Four Mind Seals of Dharma. This retreat is called the Fundamentals, the Four Seals of Buddhism. So just in case anybody has come to the wrong retreat, <laughs> just want to, you know, I have the Buddha watching me here, and I'll go, it's not the Four Mind Seals of Dharma. And actually there are Mind Seals, but that's a different uh, way of looking at it. So the first mind seal has to do with impermanence, unchanging. Now, as I said last night, there are many of you here who have been around Buddhism decades, practicing or reading Buddhism, right? Decades. And anyhow, you, you can't stumble into Buddhism without the hearing about impermanence. So I would imagine everybody here, if I asked, you know, everybody know what impermanence is, everybody here would raise their hand. Is that true? Everybody know what impermanence is? Every person? And even people who never even heard of Buddhism, if you said to them, everything changes, no, they'd say, of course everything changes. So the question becomes, why did the Buddha say that impermanence is the most important teaching of the Dharma? Interesting. He didn't just kind of skip over it. Uh, you heard him say that it is the uh, that it is the elephant's footprint, which is the largest footprint uh, in the jungle, most noticeable. So that is impermanence. It is the it has the largest footprint of anything in this. Why are, why are these uh, people in the back have these things in their ears? Because of what? Impermanence. Why is Brian downstairs taking care of uh, Aunt Chi? Because of impermanence. The mark of impermanence. Significant. Uh, the uh, the um, the seals, the idea of a seal, you know, why they're called the four seals. Uh, you know, it's like a, a seal is like a stamp, you know, it's like an ancient thing. It's like a stamp. You know, or, uh, or like, you know, the nobility, the king seal, you know, when it was stamped with the king seal, you know, it was most important. <laughs> okay. Uh, it also sort of the whole idea of sealing, you know, how we seal an envelope. It's like, you know, when we seal something, we're, we're finished with it, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's done. Impermanence is the seal of existence. The most important seal there is. Uh, I think uh, I, I, the death and dying, which of course is class last week, which of course has to do with impermanence, you know, and I've said, and I've said it before, it is only the recognition of impermanence that we have the Buddha. That is the only reason. Or the, I would say the primary reason. Because before he looked like that, he was just, uh, you know, just a young guy enjoying his life. Pleasure, the youth, the status, anything anybody could want. And for most people uh, in our society, including those of us here, we, that is what we think, you know, that's our object in life, right? If I could just stay young and healthy and have lots of nice things and have lots of pleasure in my life, and, you know, right? I mean, that is the, that is the goal 
of life. Let's say if you're wealthy, 99.9% .9 of the population, it's not true. It's well researched, but I think it's really significant. But it was only when he uh, saw the impermanence of his life when he realized that all bodies get sick, all bodies age, and all bodies die. That's, that was the most significant moment of his life up to that point. And it turned him around, you might say. And it made him look at life, his life, and the life of those around him in a radically different way. So radical that he what? He left it. There, there had to be something else. And of course, you know, you know the, uh, the fourth uh, experience he had after the first three with impermanence was he saw what we don't know, some kind of uh, recluse, some kind of hermit, some kind of somebody, you know, walking through the town and the person, you know, seemed very, serene, you know, and he asked his, uh, his chariot driver, you know, who's that? You know, so, and they said, oh, that's a, you know, a recluse, a mendicant or something. Yeah, they, they just devote themselves, you know, to spiritual practice, meditation, and they have no possessions. Yeah, they have no possessions. That, that's why he left, you see. Because if you just had the, the first three, you could what? You could despair. Oh, this, this life is pointless. Yeah? You know, I mean, what is it all, all up to if you have to leave everything? You know, why take care of your body? So you say, I'm going to die and get sick and old. And, you, know, you see what I'm saying? It's... it's it could lead to nihilism. Uh, it could lead to hedonism. You know, you know, which again, you can see this is this is our country. You know, it's a sensual pleasure, sensual pleasure, sensual pleasure, sensual pleasure. Just don't like somebody. You know, you know, okay. So, you know, you can see that the choices in the face of impermanence uh, were were not very satisfactory, and yet you see they are they are the paths that. Most people take, but when he saw the recluse who was at peace, who had serenity, and didn't have anything, you know, this kind of let him know that there is another way. You know, there is another way. One can live in this life, in the midst of this life, and have peace and serenity, without dependent. Including the body. In Buddhism, we call things phenomena. Things. So there are four Dharma seals. We'll just, uh, today we'll deal with uh, this first one, uh, the most important one. All composite phenomena are impermanent. Let me see what I put up on the board. So we are watchful. By the time we end this, this morning, everybody understands how to practice too. All composite phenomena are impermanent. So this is the first you know, seal, mark of existence that the Buddha taught. And he instructs us to meditate on it. Not just you see, it's the easiest thing to go, oh yeah, I get it. Yeah, everything's impermanent. What's 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 the second one? You see, probably already people are going, all right, what well, what's the second one? Yeah, I got I got that. Yeah. We need to meditate, reflect deeply on this. Because if we don't, we will not get the benefits. We will not become like the Buddha. 
energy and enthusiasm to achieve true serenity, true peace. And so, uh, again, uh, there may be people in this room who have, again, been exposed to these teachings for years and wonder why they don't really get any of it or don't get too involved. It's because you know, we, we only pay lip service to this. We haven't really contemplated it, reflected it, and really be willing to see it in sort of the way uh, we talk about it today. So in terms of um, phenomena, right? So composite phenomena means anything that is produced by causes and conditions. It's phenomena. Anything that is subject to cause and effect is phenomena. Composite phenomena. Right? It's, it's things that are composite. They're not just one thing. So he's talking about all composite phenomena are impermanent. What is, what's composite phenomena? Everything. Now, you can look at composite phenomena in, to begin in two ways. There's the phenomena, we might say, of the external world, and there's the phenomena of uh, human beings. Right? And uh, it's not that hard to see, is it? Right? So, uh, you know, it's not that hard to see that what? That, uh, you know, if you study uh, Geology, you learn what? About the history of the earth. What? Changes, right? Changes. All these different ages. If you study, um, uh, you know, history of the weather over the millions of years, what do you learn? Changes. Right? If you study forms of life, what do you learn? Endlessly changing, endlessly changing. Right? If you study uh, human history, what do you learn? Right? Where is the Roman Empire? Right? They're now Italians. You know what I mean? I mean, what, what do, nothing against Italians, but I mean, I mean, you know, where is the Roman Empire? <laughs> it's okay, Maria. That one, you know? It's okay. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know. Where is the Greek Empire? Right? I mean, where is the Mesopotamia? You know, Great empires. Where are they? The British Empire, where are they? Gone. Or changed. Not gone, but they changed, right? Everything changes. Nothing, because why? Because all those empires, you see, when you read the name empire, it looks like it's a thing. The Roman Empire. There was never a thing called the Roman Empire. There were just a bunch of people who had come together because of causes and conditions, you know, and were able to impose their will on other people because of causes and conditions for, for a short period of time. But there was no thing called the Roman Empire, just a name that was given to causes and conditions that had come together, you know, you see what I'm saying? And we create these stories about the Roman Empire. I mean, you can't see the Roman Empire, can you? Why not? Anybody go looking for the Roman Empire? The Greek Empire? Why not? Why can't you find any trace of it? What? Because it's, it's gone. Because why is it gone? Because it never really existed in any real permanent way. It was just the coming together of causes and conditions like the weather, like the climate, coming together of causes and conditions. And everything that comes together because of causes and conditions is impermanent, is subject to cause and effect. The opposite of, uh, of, of, of impermanence is what? Permanence. Okay. Deluded people believe in what? Permanence. 
believe these things are solid and will last forever, or at least as long as they want them to last. Right? So, I mean, I could go on. Is that clear? I mean, you could, you could, you know, science and history <laughs> will explain, and geology and everything will explain in permanence, right? In the in the external way. It is endlessly subject to change because that is its nature. It is marked. All composite phenomena are marked with impermanence. It is impossible for them to stay stable because they're not permanent. They're just a collection of things, parts. And all those parts are coming together just temporarily because of causes and conditions. Is that true? This building, right, which appears solid, it's only the coming together. Right? I mean, watch a building being constructed over there. What, what are they doing? They're just bringing parts together right? and putting them together. And all of a sudden, a building appears. And we look at the building and we think, what? It's solid. It's real. It's permanent. But you see how limited our view is. And I hate to tell you, it's all that work ultimately for naught. Is that clear? I mean, this has to be reflect. I mean, I'm saying these words and everybody's agreeing, but no, no, we don't get it. Because in the face of change, we what? We suffer. Why do we suffer? Because we believe in permanence. We don't believe in impermanence. We don't believe in that everything is composite, that everything is is subject to causes and conditions and, and the law of cause and effect. Yeah. So you have to look more deeply because things appear solid. Right? See, there is, an, uh, there is some kind of innate problem with being a human being with very limited resources. Through, I mean, we only know the world through our senses. So how do things look to us? How do things always look to us? Solid, right? right? I look at Misty, she looks like, that. that's Misty, you see? I can't see that she's impermanent and changing and dying and aging and subject to illness when I look at her, can I? Because she doesn't, I don't see it with my eyes. You see, you know, if, if, I, if, 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 if she was complaining about something and I wanted to see what was inside her, I can't do that. I have to do what? We have to do what? What? No, well, no, I meant we have to what? Get an x-ray or get an MRI, you know, because our eyes can't see what's really there. And yet we think we see what's really there. So our senses give us very limited data. It's very kind of linear, one-dimensional. Right? I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into territory that I'm not safe in. But like, you see, we hear, we hear sounds, right? But what is sound? Vibrations, but we don't hear it like that, do we? You see, so our 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 sense senses are very limited. Right now, as I you know, Buddhism is interesting. You know that these these uh, these great meditators could see so deeply. So they talked about macro and micro. Right? So. The impermanence that I was just talking about can be observed. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you can somewhat, you know, I mean, I could, you know, Misty could show me pictures of when she was a baby, and, and I could see, oh, Misty is really impermanent. You see, I could, I could see that, but, you know, with, with some evidence. But like I said, I can't see inside her, you see. And I can't really, because she looks solid, you see. But 
what does science tell us about? I mean, her body is made up of how many parts? How many? What? Many. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> more than a hundred? More than a thousand? More than, you know, more than a trillion? And each of those parts you can break down into what? Subparts. And science keeps, right? Finding more, you know, physics more and more subparts until they get down to what? Nothing. Can it, you know what I mean? It's like, you see, but we don't see that, do we? You know, we see solidity. Right? Now, it's very interesting. Buddhist meditators and Buddhist teachings talked about these infinitesimally tiny particles, right? That are in motion, that make up everything. Now, how did they know that? But, but that's what they said. They, 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 they talk about momentariness. It's a very big concept. You know, it's like things are, t you know, changing moment to moment. How long is a moment? You know, and they would just subdivide them up, 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 until they could no longer subdivide them. It was so infinitesimal. You know, that's really what's going on here. But we don't see that, do we? I mean, if I said... You know, this building's impermanent, right? You would say, all right, I can, you know, we could talk about, yeah, I mean, we could take it all apart, we could take out the windows, we could, you know, fire, or, you know what I mean? Or we could just destroy it ourselves, right? I mean, we can get a wrecking crew out here and then uh, probably in the morning, right? Just blow it up and, you know, see, it's, it appears so solid, gone. Right? But what we don't see, see, how do those walls look to you? Solid? But what would a scientist say about matter, the solidity of those walls? Anybody here ever, I mean, what would they say? It's decaying, but it's also in motion. It's not solid. It appears solid. It feels solid. Again, touch is another sense organ. You see, we can't see what is really going on here. That everything is composite, big. See, we don't understand. See, why? Why will this building? Why? Why is Misty and the building decaying? It's because really of this particular momentary lack of solidity. You know, that everything's in motion. Right. That's what's happening on the micro level. It manifests on the macro level. So this pertains to the way we perceive the outer world. Okay. We do not perceive it as it really is. We perceive it in a deluded way. Right? And because of this innate misperception that things, you know, we hear sounds, we smell, you know, that things appear solid, we, our senses give misinformation to our minds. You see, at the fundamental level, it gives misinformation. Does our mind know that? Left to its own devices? Absolutely not. Right? So, acting on that totally false information, it acts in the world. Thinking that things are solid and permanent. Oh, we're just talking about permanence. So, Seeing, getting a feel for the impermanent, the true impermanent macro micro nature of phenomena is so important. Because it, it, it really lets us live in reality. Reality is how things are. Now, now let's come, so that's sort of the external world which is important to understand because, you know, we are so involved in the things of the external world. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Now, the, the sort of inner, in, in, you know, that's sort of the outer world or the container of the world, but then there's us. <laughs> you and me who live within the container of the world. 
we also, and all human beings are also impermanent. I mean, that's where the Buddha began, sickness, old age, and death. And that was a big All bodies are subject to decay. Aging is just another, it's a fancy word for what? Yeah, well, for decaying, deteriorating. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, that's we can pretty it up. Aging. What? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't go, oh, hmm, you know, decaying. Look at all these decaying people in here. No, we, we don't say that. We say what? Senior citizens. At the, what, what they also say, like, the, you know, the prime of one's life. The golden years, exactly, you know, the golden years. Rather than, yeah, getting closer to death, dying, decaying, all downhill. No, these are the golden years. Uh, again, that's another matter. Uh, yeah, so sickness, old age, and death. Fundamental truth of life. You know, for those of you who are in the death and dying course, or know again, the meditation on death is central. I brought some sets of Tatra Rinpoche to see if we get time. I mean, it is, it is the, you know, it is in the Buddhist tradition. It is so emphasized that practitioners need to meditate daily on death, remind themselves daily on death. And in the early stages of their practice, really devote themselves to uh, contemplating, meditating on uh, the impermanence of their body. So we see clearly. Because right now we look in the mirror again, and how does it look? It looks what? It looks solid. It looks real. We, we, we see ourselves, you know, just in a very, you know, narrow frame of time and space. We don't see, you know, we don't see sickness, old age, and death is inherent in having a human body. We don't see our time limitedness, do we, when we look in the mirror? We don't see the, un, you know, we don't, not only do we not see our time limited and not see our death, we don't see when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen or even that it's going to happen. Do we? No, none of that, you see, because we're relying on what? To live our life. What? Sensory experience. And the, you know, that's the problem, you see, because we are misinterpreting what is seen. So without insight, without looking more deeply into, without reflecting, you know, we will not see what's really going on. And therefore we will what? We will live a deluded life. We will live a life in what in Buddhism is called ignorance. We are, we are ignorant of how things really are. So all our choices, all our decisions, you know, based on attachment and aversion are based on totally faulty and distorted information senses are giving us. Right? I mean, the freezer looked, I don't even know what's going on down there, but the freezer looks solid, doesn't it? <laughs> well, in, unless it's starting to fall apart, it probably still looks solid. Right, right. So it, I'm saying, so if you, if you look at it, it looks, right? it looks like a freezer. Yeah, it's all workable. Right? We don't see that it's made of parts, and those parts have a temporariness. Those parts are deteriorating. Right? I mean, if you ever want to get into deterioration, buy a new car. I just bought a, a brand new car. What do they say? It loses 25% of its value as soon as you drive it out? I mean, what does that mean? You see what I'm saying? It's like they know that. You see, they know that that, that car is deteriorating. Right? We go, ah, what a, let's get a new car. They know it's deteriorating. It's not going to last. They have a new 
immediately discount the value. I think they, they must be studying Buddhism. Uh, impermanence. So there's the, the, the large impermanences of sickness, old age, and death, and, and change, but everything is changing impermanent in our life. Um, relationships, are they permanent? Has anybody ever been disappointed when a relationship has changed? Angry, sad, scared, and it, and it never happened to anybody. Why do you think that? Why do you think that happens? Because everything is impermanent. It was a coming together. It's a coming together of lots of causes and conditions supported by cause and effect, and there's a temporariness in everything. How many relationships have you had in this life? Think about it. I'm not talking about intimate relationships. You know, in your neighborhood, your family, your school, your schoolmates, you know, people you work with, people you knew. I mean, how many relationships do you think you've had in this life? What? Thousands. Where are they all? How'd they all end up? The way they started? You see, as human beings, we make a story up about it, don't we? So everything looks like this is, I, this, I have a story, you know, for every though in those thousands relationship, we'll, we'll have a story about why it didn't last. But we, we, we don't see the mark. We don't see the seal. Oh, everything. The truth is, it's only because of you permanence of all composites. That's why. That's what's going on. Endlessly going on. We are participating in the mark where the essential mark of all phenomena is impermanence. And we don't see it. So we are what? We're very deluded and therefore we attach and avert and from that comes all the emotionality, all the drama, all that comes from what? Not understanding. So everything is marked by impermanence. Any, any uh, questions about anything that's been said so far? Because what I'm sort of laying out to you is a process of meditation. Each of us needs to do this and should be doing every day. Because why? Because it's got to get in. And we are so uh, skewed in not seeing what's so apparent if you look. So we, we have to force ourselves to look. Right? Not to look at a Buddhist teaching. To look at reality. This is not a teaching. This is not theology. This is not philosophy. This is the Buddhist teaching that came from observing life around and within. Are there any questions remaining? Anybody having trouble with this? Getting the significance of this. A little freaked out by this. Yes. Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. seems that it, for me and some of the people that I'm with, it's less about not 
seeing impermanence and more about what happens then in the mind in the face of it. I think about you know recognizing impermanence and then fighting against it. Like th that's the grasping and aversion. So is there, is it that if we truly understood it, there would be no grasping and aversion? Well, let's hold off on that. Okay. Let's just let's just continue. But that's yeah. That's I mean that's what it's all about. Right. I mean. You know, I mean, you know, there are some philosophers or whatever who, who I'm not sure philosophers or what, you know, who, or psychologists or something say, you know, it's all about people's fear of death. You know, it's like an unconscious thing. People are just afraid of dying. That's what the whole thing is about. But, uh, you know, either, either way, yeah, it is, it is the key. So, uh, relationships, permanent or impermanent? You think at the time they were permanent? Right. Anybody go to a, ever go to a wedding? No? Anybody ever been to a wedding? What a, what a, what a, what a, what do we say at a wedding? To a death do us part, right? Do they mean it at the time? No. What are they missing? Impermanence. And it's it's causes and conditions can cause it to diminish and strengthen. Doesn't mean you can't deal with it and create a relationship, but it's like, you know, it's not just going to happen. There's no such thing as permanence. Because nothing stays the same moment to moment. So there is, uh, you know, the human being, the body of the human being, the relationships of the human being, the unfolding of the human being uh, in their life totally, totally marked by impermanence. Now let's look into the mind. Right? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions. What have we noticed about thoughts, feelings, perceptions? What? They what? They come and go. Which is just another word for talking about impermanence. They appear and disappear. How about emotions? Anybody ever have an emotion? Do they change? They do. They come and go. They come and go just like that. Somebody does something and you can immediately get what? does something else, you immediately get happy. And then you get angry. And then you get happy. And then you get angry. And then you get angry. Right? It's, there's no stability in emotions. There's no stability in thought. See? It's now 11.30. When did we start this talk? What? No, that's a meditation, but the talk started 10.45. Where's the talk? Where's every word that was spoken so far? Gone. Why, why did it go? Because it had the mark of impermanence. Because it was a composite thing. Words, sound. Memory, retention, I mean, all these things. This is, this, is, this is the way it is. Everything is appearing and disappearing, moment to moment. Is that true? Every experience you've had, this past few days, good ones, bad ones, ones that made you happy, ones that made you sad, ones that made you scared, ones that made you angry, right? You know what I'm talking about? Where are they all? Why? Why are they gone? The impermanence. But at the time, at the time, what did we think? How did we perceive that experience? As real, as permanent. We 
can just let it appear and disappear. That experience, happy, sad, and as soon as it's over, it's over. Is that true? And yet, in our delusion, what do we do? What? Hold on. But even holding on is impermanent. Because if you actually, and I want you to do that, examine your mind, how you hold on. You know, pick, pick, you know, your favorite drama, you know, that you always love to, you know, go over and over in your mind. See, why do you have to keep going over and over it? What? Because it's gone as soon as you, you know, so you got to, oh, I got I, I to gotta, I gotta repeat it again. But you see, every time you repeat it, it's new. You think you're repeating the old, but you're repeating it, it's always new. Get impermanence, you'll have great, you're on the way to liberation, freedom. Take a moment, look in your own life. What are we grasping? Go down to eat. Ooh, we have a big breakfast. Very exciting. Cool. Some more pepper. Oh, that's so good. Mm. Right? Very exciting. Just scoop it in as if it's somehow. And the truth is, even if we found the breakfast pleasurable or unpleasurable, at the end we get to what? An empty bowl. There's nothing there. It, it, it didn't matter, did it? And yet in the beginning, oh, it mattered. Wonderful breakfast, terrible breakfast. Right? And then we might have thought about it afterwards. Gee. Wait, where'd they get Brian from? <laughs> hmm? Gotta remember on the evaluation to put down bad breakfast. Or somebody else, or the next person next to you is going, what? What? What a great breakfast. It's wonderful to have Brian in the kitchen. I'm gonna, on his evaluation, I'm gonna put down that. And yet it, you know, it's over. Every taste, every spoonful has the mark of impermanence, right? And yet, even little things like that we can make a big deal about. Attachment to aversion. Please. Reflect on how everything has the mark of impermanence. Everything's in motion. Nothing is stable. Right? Internal, external, mind, you know, external phenomena, material phenomena, mental phenomena. And yet, in the midst of this, we search for permanence. We detach and avert. And then, suffer because of this fundamental misperception that impermanence is real. Yes, Charlie. Uh, hold, wait, wait. It seems like in the Dharma teachings that it's implied that awareness is permanent and constant? I don't, I don't know. That puzzles me. Don't be puzzled. Yeah. Well, 
So what about that? Even <laughs> even your puzzlement is impermanent. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's your own discovery. It's, I mean, where does that that awareness is is right here? You can you can look into it. Is there anything to it? As I look over my lifetime, it's always been there. Yeah. No. And some other that's not, a thought. Some other people. No, no. There's no you, you, not there. you, there's no awareness has been there your whole life. I thought they're just more thoughts. It's all past. Your whole lifetime is past. You have to look into the present to see what's here. Forget about the past. Discover what's going on right now. What's real right now. You'll never find liberation in the past or future because it doesn't exist. Does it? Your life, your history, what you did, what you didn't do, whether awareness was there or not there. What is that? It's distorted. This is what's real. If you want to discover nature of things, just look into your mind right now. That's what, that's what we, that's what I want us to do today. I mean, the laboratory, this is, you know, the Buddhist laboratory is our own experience. Okay. And is that, does that answer your question? It's up, it's up to me. I mean, it's yeah, that's what practice is about. It's, it's, it's yeah. meditation about looking for the nature of our own experience. Remember, I said earlier, you know, it has to become our experience. First, we get the teachings, we get the view, how to see things. So the, these are the teachings. That come first. We we get we get the path. We get the view, but then we have to realize it. We have to practice. So we have to practice impermanence. How do we practice impermanence? Everything we see, internal and external, we we look deeply and see: is it permanent or impermanent? Somebody sitting next to cat. You see. Is a friend of yours, Kathy? Is it there? No? So it's got us sitting there, right? <coughs> see, that's us, you see. But we don't see that, do we? We see the outer covering. You see? We see the outer covering. But the outer covering has the shape because of that. But we don't see that. You see? It's like we don't, you know, yeah, we don't see. We don't have, we don't have clear seeing. But that's really, and that's everybody. You know, people you think are beautiful, think are handsome, or this, or ugly, or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's that's the truth. This is just temporary, very temporary. I mean, you know, I mean, human life has been on Earth for how many years? Give me a number. A couple of million. I like that, Alex. Always up for a good number. <laughs> a couple of million. And our life is how long? It's like nothing. You know, 70, 80 years, you know, on the average. And that's it. We have to look at the skeletons to, to see, oh, that's, you know. I gave people the homework in the death and dying class that every time they look in the mirror this week to see, see if they can, you know, reflect that underneath whatever they see is a skeleton. You know, 
and all they are is a bunch of, you know, what? Organs and tissues and, you know, all stuff that's kind of held in by this skin bag. Right? That's real. I mean, this is, you know, it's just a bag. You know, keeping everything from falling out. Okay? I know some people might be insulted by that. <laughs> Feel demeaned. You know, but that's, you know, I mean, I mean, that's why we have skin, right? Just to keep the stuff from falling out. <laughs> Please reflect on that. <laughs> Not just for yourself, but for everybody else. That's what you're saying. Just a bunch of skin bags. You see, think about somebody who you really think is, is very beautiful or you're attracted to, right? Just, just close your eyes and bring that person to mind. You see, very attractive. Very attracted to them. Right? Everybody have a somebody in mind. Just bring somebody to mind. Okay. Now, your attraction is to their skin, to their shape. Right? You don't. You don't. You don't want to see the stuff that's in their digestive system, do you? Anybody want to see that? Anybody want to see their liver and their pancreas and get a good whiff of that? We laugh. You see, but it's, it's, you see, we don't, ooh, they're like, Fred, don't do that. <laughs> You're kind of ruining it for me. <laughs> but that's, that's the truth, too. I mean, the skin is true and the outward is true, but that's, you know, that's true, too. And that person that you think is so attractive, they're deteriorating as we speak. Is that not true? Not good, bad, right, wrong. Is that not true? Yes. I think of my body like a car. So, I mean, you could have, you know, like a, it, it's all about who's driving it. I mean, you could have a, a Bentley with Donald Trump in there, and you could have a Yugo with the Dalai Lama or the Pope, you know. I mean, it, it, it depends on your, your physical body is deteriorating, but like you're, when you're talking about awareness, you know, like I have awareness from when I was small, it's still now, it'll be later. There, there's a continuity there, even though things are changing, thoughts are coming and going, things are happening, things are See, going. See, that's very through. interesting, the way you said that. Uh, yeah, we see a continuity, don't we? We think there's something that, like, that was me as a child, right? And now I'm um, me here, mm -hmm. and there will be a me in the future. You see, that's the way we talk, don't we? And yet, you know, it's like, um, it's, well, it's like a waterfall. Right? When we see a waterfall, what does it look like? What a cascade of solid water. And yet, Again, that's a misperception because actually it's made up of what? And drops, millions or billions of drops. But they're moving very fast and they give the illusion of that there's something there, like a river, like a cat, like a Fred. And yet, you know, the way you, we say that, right? There are all these kind of discrete moments, and yet, is, has there really been, we'll be getting there, is there really a solid, permanent cat that's always been there? Nothing physical is permanent. And nothing mental is permanent. Thoughts come and go. Exactly. Even the I thought, even the cat thought. Right. You have to create the cat thought. But you're aware of your thought. You're right, and you're aware of all these things, but, but what we're talking about is you're aware that all the things that you're aware of, all phenomena, physical and mental, are in 
permanent. They have no solid permanent existence at all, including our thoughts, our memories. They're all composites. Right. It's all like a movie in your awareness. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, slow down. Yeah. We're, 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 we're getting there. Right. But that is, that is actually but what you stumbled into, Kat, which is really the biggest one, which is we perceive the self, the I, as also some kind of permanent thing that links all these experiences, past, present, and future, to me. And yet, if you look into your mind, which I want you to do today, you know, the I thought, the me thought, is something we have to create over and over again, don't we? What? Because we don't, yeah, it seems, he's saying, yeah, I do, but it, it seems constant. But if you look in your mind, you'll, you'll see you're, we're constantly having to renew our identification as me. Right? Because the I thought is not constant, it's a thought. This happened to me, she did this to me, he said this to me. Right? You see? That, you see? <laughs> Try to be angry without the story of me. Hmm? You see, we, we have to continually recreate the scenario, but also we have to continually recreate the scenario of me. Right? Can you see that? It wasn't there a minute ago, and I was very happy. Then all of a sudden I think about that. Right? So I have to, I have to do it, don't I? Even because all experiences, physical and mental, are composites. Things are coming together. And when they come together, they manifest momentarily. That's why, you know, that's why there may be people you loved, now you hate. How'd that happen? Anybody ever, can anybody guess? And there might have been people who you hated and disliked, and now you think, well, they were Pretty nice. Now they got to know them. Why is that? Impermanence. All our emotions, our thoughts, our statements are all transitory. They have no substance. They're all impermanent. And yet, and yet, and yet we grasp, we attach, we impute, we impute solidity and permanence to that which is. And therefore we suffer. Is that true or not? I mean, this is the contemplation. You know, when, when you're doing the contemplation on death and impermanence, which I want us to do today, is you look at everything in this world. Everything in the external world, you, you just, oh, you know, everything is just made of parts. Everything is deteriorating. Every, you know, no, nothing has any permanence. I mean, you look up in the, you know, and we say, oh, it's getting cloudy. You know, have you noticed that? We say, oh, it was sunny, now it's getting cloudy. But we're just noting what? Impermanence. You see? Because somehow when we looked up this morning and it was a sunny day, we thought, oh, it's a sunny. No, it's not. A, it's just in this moment. In, all we know is in this moment, this is what's happening. But do we know what's going to happen? Yet we act as if we do, and we you know, get disappointed if it were not. It's sunny again. Now I can be happy. Right? A minute ago, I was cloudy. I was not happy. Right? You see? It's going on all the time. In the external world, but most importantly, in the internal. Thoughts, feelings, perception, I, me, mine, past, present, future, memories. Is it all impermanent? Bodies and thoughts. You know, can you see the skeleton as you look around the room and realize everybody in this room is dying? We're all going to the same destiny. Right? You know, 
the way it happens and, and when it'll happen will be different for all of us, but we're, we're all going to the same place. significant. It's a significant piece of information. Anybody see the implication of that? Of death? For our lives? And how we order our lives? And how we value our lives? And how we order our All of us who think, well, I know impermanence, I've meditated on impermanence. If we had really done it, we probably wouldn't be here right now. Now, just in terms of doing this in a meditative way, when you do this kind of deconstruction of everything and you see the impermanence, over time it becomes sort of a feeling. You get a feel for the impermanent nature of things. It's a feeling. It's not, you don't, because you're no longer perceiving things as solid, permanent, right? You just, you're just noticing over and over again, inside and outside, that everything is transitory, everything is passing, you know? And it becomes a feeling. You have a feel for the impermanence of life. The same way now we have a feeling for the solidity of things, the permanence of things. And so that's, you, that's how you know it's beginning to have an effect. And, and in, when you do it in your meditation, and you sort of get to this you know, sense of kind of everything is in transition, everything is impermanent, everything, nothing is solid. And as a feeling, then you kind of just relax into that. Okay. Because that med the meditation should really be a great kind of letting go feeling of inside you, because you kind of get it. And then at the end of your meditation, you just relax into that kind of open, spacious, non-attached, just relaxing. So there is a way to do this meditation that actually produces a kind of change in how you feel inside. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so to do this meditation, are you suggest, would you suggest that we take an object and really take it apart or just kind of scan across the, everything that comes into our... Well, again, I think the way I've done it in the past hour or so is really how you do it. Um, you know, Angie, maybe you could write a few things down so people can remember. So there's the impermanence of the outer world, right? And then there's the impermanence of, that's the, called the container. And then there's the inner, which is in this sense, human beings. So there's, there's the, you know, so that's that. And then, um, and then we see impermanence of these two types. You know, it's called continuous, which really just means sort of the macro, the observable, right? And then there is the micro, which we talked about, you know, which is not observable. I mean, to, to the great meditators in the past, it was observable in deep meditative states. Uh, you know, now because of science and scientific instruments, you know, there's much more discovery of, of, the, of how things really are, you see. So, uh, but it's not observable. So, so sort of the, 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 the macro is observable to the senses, is observable to the, to the mind. I mean, we can see things change, you know, all the weather, but really what's going on Give me, give me user names. Uh, you know, we don't see that. But, but it's important to know because it just reinforces this sense of the impermanence of things, you know, that everything's in motion, there's no stability. And then again, there is this uh, 
the other thing is this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of innate and kind of in what they call imputed, which I've sort of been referring to. Innate is this, this kind of, this innate belief in permanence comes from, again, the misinformation of our senses. It's not like a thinking thing. It's like, you know, a baby will have it. They'll look out in the world and they'll see solid things, you know, to their eyes. See what I mean? So it's kind of an innate misperception. Things look solid. Things, right? Is that clear? That's kind of called innate. But it's a misperception because it's really not seeing that things are changing constantly. And then the, uh, the imputed is like all the, you know, all the wrong teachings we've got, which is just to reinforce the sense of permanence in the world, the permanence of self, you know, Western psychology, you know, our whole, our whole, you know, our whole society is based on what? Things are, things are permanent. You know, you can get this, and when you get that, that'll be really great. Right? Because we think we're getting something that's, that's permanent. Right? And therefore, when we get it, we are what? Happy. And when we discover its impermanence, we are what? Sad, disappointed, or we have to go. Uh -oh. You know that's why people are just. Oh, you know what's next? Right, great weekend. What are we gonna do next weekend? Why, 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 why do people talk this way? Hmm? Oh, get a get a good vacation, get a good weekend, get a good job, get a good relationship. Then what? Then I'll be happy and everything will be great. And then they're disappointed. Again, we, 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 we have stories how we interpret it, but it's really just, it's just impermanence. Why? Because it causes and conditions. If we understood causes and conditions, cause and effect, we would understand why things are the way they are. Anybody having a hard time with this? Anybody not? Hmm? Yes. Oh, oh, I thought, oh, okay. I don't, your hand, your hand actually went up. I saw it. It involuntarily kind of just went like that. Anyhow, but I will respect that the head says no. <laughs> Any, yeah, Alex? Yeah, it's just an interesting sort of connection, but children um, up until 18 months of age have this thing called object impermanence. And what happens is, you know, they'll, they'll look at, something like a wall, they'll turn away, and then when they look back, they're amazed that it's still there, <laughs> because it's like, why would that still be there? I just yeah. looked away. But again, it's the way we learn, but right. we're born with this, with yeah. this object and permanence, and then we correct it. <laughs> right. Exactly yeah, which is, what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and you know, when a baby is very, very young, um, and when mama disappears, she doesn't exist. Mm. And um, it's frightening, and you know, there's that need for her yeah. to come back, and she does. And it's only kind of through time that that innate thing that we do, the process of our learning and realizing that objects are actually permanent. <laughs> right, uh -huh. but the interesting thing is, uh, I mean, I, I, it's been many years since I've thought about that right. theory, but actually that is a, a correct perception. When when the person is gone, they're really gone. You don't you don't really know they're going to come back. It's only over time that the, we, we we develop, uh, you know, like you said, a story of permanence, right. which is helpful, <laughs> but then can be very disappointing. Yeah, it's it's right? almost like it's like a, when mother won't go away anymore. She's it's like, part <laughs> of the learning process that that um, that we need for you know safety and to you know to, to be become part of the human tribe. I understand, but, but can you see the, no, I do. the yeah. cost of it? Because it's, it's this, I mean, in Buddhist, in the Buddhist way of looking at it is to find the safety and the ground in the impermanence, in the acceptance when mother disappears, she may not come back. When we say goodbye to somebody, see you next week, we may never, you know, we may not be there, they may not be there. So it's, it's an illusion. And Buddhism at this stage, you know, this is, this is not for babies. 
Right. But at this stage, this is to help us see how we've just built our whole life, safety and all that, out of an illusion. And that it's much, I mean, you know, you know what we're going to learn in these couple of days is even in the face of this, the devastating news of impermanence, of death, remember the fourth, we can find happiness, we can find peace. There's a way, but it's in impermanence. It's in the world. Yes. And then we'll, you know, so lunch is at 12.30. Who's going to do outdoor work? So it's interesting that there's been a lot of research recently that um, shows that animals and human beings do not actually perceive things and however the scientists determined was a real way. I don't know how they did that. But that in fact all of us as animals have evolved in a way that helps us survive. So we perceive things in a way that helps us survive. And you think about animals are reactionary. Human beings are without mindfulness reactionary. Right. And that misperception served us but because of where we are now it doesn't serve us anymore. But you know, kind of a little up against that. Right. So, I mean, I, again, I mean, we could go on and on talking, but I think the bottom line from these last sharings is, again, to understand Buddhist teachings is not theology. Okay? It's not, the, it's not, it's not a revelation. Right? I mean, the Buddha based his teachings on reality. That's, that's why... That's, a, that's significant. I don't say that to say that why Buddhism is better than. I'm just saying it's very different than most religions because it's not religious in, in the truest sense. The Buddha based it on observation, both the external observation very uh, clearly of the, uh, of the container, the external reality, but most important for, for us is the internal reality of experience we have as human beings through our senses and how easily we are misled. And so the, these teachings are a powerful corrective. So is that, is that clear? I mean, like, what I want you to do is, is kind of be obsessive about just watching, you know, watch, watch your feeling states. Watch your pleasure, displeasure, you know, as, as you eat. You know, as you as you see people, as you just observe, just really kind of observe minutely how your mind is just constantly changing, and how these sensations—positive, negative, pleasant, unpleasant—constantly changing. Right? And again, you know, like like we said, you know, look at your own body, look at other people's bodies, and realize we are misperceiving the totality of what they are. You know, we, we can't see what's going on inside. We can't see the motion, can we? So, and again, it should, it, it, it'll just, it, you know, it, it may freak you out if you haven't really done this before. It may be very disconcerting, which is good, you know, it's like, but over time, it really, it really creates a very great kind of, open ease in life. It's like a feeling, oh, so you're not, you just let things be. Right? And then you, in your meditation, you just relax, open, spacious, exquisite.